without interruption. All right. So um, before I start uh, digging a bit deeper into the digital product ethics canvas, I just want to give you a little bit of a background where I'm actually coming from and why I'm developing all those tools and what's the, the rationale behind that. So um, I started thinking about these tools uh, back in 2013 when I started uh, working in the management consulting space. At the time I was working um, on the focus of digital product development, mainly within the IoT space. So I was working on a lot of products related to connected cars and smart home sector, um, and also on the topic of digital transformation. And since um, my background has always been related to sustainability, so for example, um, I did a PhD and worked in R&D in the UK on the topic of more environmentally friendly aircraft engines, the topic of sustainability was really close to my heart. And what I noticed is that in most corporates, it had not been taken seriously at all. So I noticed that um, both in terms of mindset, is sustainability something we want to take seriously or not? There was quite a lot to be done, but also in terms of technical ability, what is actually impact, what is sustainability? How do we measure it? There was a lot of um, room for improvement. And um, I was thinking back then, how can I change that? What would be a good story? What, what would motivate a company to change business practices? And um, I started to develop um, a, a range of tools for a range of reasons, which um, addressed, for example, the topic of circularity or impact measurement, for example, the sustainable business model canvas and the impact canvas. And these tools are then shared at, um, in SlideShare. They became quite popular. Lots of people looked at them and universities started to ask me whether I can build a curriculum around that, but I, but I can start to develop lectures around it. And I'm currently teaching at three universities in Berlin, at the ESCP, at the TU Berlin, and the Steinbeis University. And this is basically, these are the lecture notes I'm using there. And I just want to flick through a number of slides that are relevant for today in terms of background, why it's important for companies actually to take these issues seriously, and um, how employees can uh, essentially make a difference in companies using such tools. So I'm just going to flick through some of those, um, those slides. Basically, my, my, my main aim back in 2014-15 was to make companies realize that uh, impact or sustainability is a business opportunity. Basically, that it makes sense for a company to think about it. And um, that is because um, of a variety of reasons. If you actually can show that you make a positive impact or you take sustainability seriously, you can often reduce costs, you can uh, keep employees uh, more motivated, which is relevant for us today now with the um, digital product ethics canvas, you have a much better brand and you reduce risks uh, to market for the sustainability context that would be, let's assume a certain material would be prohibited by regulation in the future. If you have that on the radar, you could proactively work around that by working on substitute materials early on. Um, likewise, in a digital context, that would mean if, for example, uh, data privacy is on the horizon to receive much more attention by regulators in the future, you could proactively work with those regulators, um, shape that regulation in a way that is um, actually working um, towards what you want to do in, in, in your product. And another reason why it's uh, important is that impact has an increasing importance for investors, for example, institutional investors, and therefore gives you better access to capital. So these are just some of the general um, business reasons why the topic of impact, doing good, whatever you would like to call it, should be relevant for companies. And Whilst in 2014 and 2015, it wasn't really that convincing, it's become more mainstream by now. Reason number one, positive impact on the bottom line. Another reason why I advocate for taking sustainability seriously in a corporate context or impact in this case, is that it actually drives innovation. And why is that? 
Um, typically, if you look at what drives innovation, it's a constraint. Uh, there's this saying, necessity is the father of invention. Why is that? If you are suddenly forced to work around a problem, let's say you have no access to oil and you need an, uh, an alternative fuel source, you're looking at problems with a different mindset, you focus on, um, you have new boundary conditions and you sometimes come up with new ideas, which is why, for example, sadly, during war times, you, you come up with a huge acceleration in the innovation process. And this reason, uh, if you want to actually influence um, a, a corporate from the inside or a client, if you're a consultant, is already in many cases quite, quite, quite powerful. And there's a study uh, that, uh, that shows that there's an actual causation between how important a company considers impact or sustainability and how innovative this company is. I'm happy to send uh, those, those notes, the whole lecture notes around later on if you want to have a, access to a link to this study. And so coming back now to the digital product ethics canvas, um, we now have two reasons why companies should take sustainability or impact seriously. One, the classic bottom line argument. Two, the argument that if you introduce a new constraint in your product development process, let's say, we must have a circular economy concept related to our um, hardware. Or in the case of uh, a digital product, we must take data privacy uh, much more seriously than we did so far. Then that can spur innovation. There's also a third reason what you, that you can use in a company um, to argue for your cause. And that is the argument where you relate what you want to achieve to the values the company promotes publicly. So for example, let's assume you're an employee and you realize that your company is publicly claiming to do no evil, to use a famous example, and you can find out how it's not actually happening in practice. You can go to your manager or you can go to whomever um, you, um, you can think of and make a case, look, there's a disconnect between what we publicly, publicly are claiming and what we are actually doing. Basically, we are not living up to our values and you can argue the moral case. So again, to sum up, we have the classic bottom line, we have the innovation case, and we have the moral case. And what I always do uh, in the lectures, I'm asking students, which do they think is the most convincing argument if you are in the setting of a corporate? And um, uh, I'm not going to ask it right now, but typically the answers are, we think the classic business case argument is the most convincing one. Some people say the argument about the innovation capability is the most convincing one. But almost no one says that the argument for the moral case has any, valid, uh, any value. So everyone thinks that it's a very weak argument and it doesn't help. However, uh, that's obviously a trick question I'm typically asking. There's data that shows if you can actually appeal to a dissonance, a disconnect between the values a company is standing for publicly and what the co company is actually doing. In many cases, you will have a stronger argument in practice than the bottom line argument. So in other words, to, to say that again, because it's actually so amazing, what we would consider the weakest argument normally, instinctively, saying we are doing bad things and that shouldn't be the case because what we claim publicly to do is totally different, is actually on the same level in terms of argumentative power as the um, other arguments. And that is important for the digital product ethics canvas because unlike some of the other tools um, I, I developed, like for example, the sustainable business model canvas or the impact canvas, it is still early days for product ethics and arguments against being, uh, against, for example, causing addiction amongst users typically have less business relevance. So essentially that was the little introduction I wanted to give. Uh, let's see whether there's anything else that's relevant. 
um, for us. Um, I think for today we can probably shift that, uh, skip that, but, but essentially mm, the reason I found developing canvas-based tools very um, effective and the reason I think that promoting canvas-based tools in a corporate setting is actually a very powerful way to promote change in a company is because not only do they actually raise the awareness for certain issues in a company, let's say for example at the beginning in 2014 or 15 when the sustainable business model canvas came out, not many people were considering circular economy. Therefore, it wasn't on their radar. And that was actually the motivation behind me developing the sustainable business model canvas. Uh, more specifically, I was in a company where employees were working on a connected car product and it was actually for lorries in China. And they complained, as you hear many times, that they felt that their work has no meaning. For these people, it wasn't even on their radar that with this product, they could create a positive impact, for example, by reducing the fuel consumption through um, drive style behavior nudges. So that was what prompted me to develop the sustainable business model canvas because it brings to the attention of employees an issue that they weren't previously thinking about. And that can lead to a mindset shift in the company where you, for example, say, um, we don't need to only compensate anymore for the bad things we do with, let's say, carbon credits or some CSR greenwashing activities. We can actually change the way we do businesses. Um, and it also contributes to a mindset of saying, we don't need to make financial sacrifices to be sustainable to actually there's a number of business opportunities we can capture. Um, and the second important and change these tools can actually help achieve in a company is to look at externalities. And that is so super important because um, companies typically, when they think about impact and sustainability and the compensating measures they can do, they typically look at what are the resources we use to produce this service or what are the resources we use to produce this product in this car. So they're looking at the impact of the product during the make phase. Let's say this car takes this amount of energy to produce, the metal that goes into it is this, this amount, or in case I'm a company that doesn't produce a physical product, our company uses this amount of energy. This is a really cool cat, by the way, Anthony. Um, and what we need is to actually look at, we need to shift the behavior, and that's a Herculean task, actually. We, we need to shift the mindset where companies care about what do the products do once they leave the shop? What happens if someone buys my car? And can I positively influence that? Or what happens if someone uses my digital product? And can I positively influence that? And I believe, I really believe that it starts with awareness. It starts with knowing what the products have in terms of impact. Um, and that is what uh, those tools can, in my opinion, contribute to. Um, going further to um, some of the tools immediately, um, which are relevant to, the, to this tool. So I mentioned already the Sustainable Business Model Canvas, which in its principle mimics the classic business model canvas. It has a number of additional fields like the end of life field, for example, in all these individual fields, you have different prompts that are actually specifically related to the topic of uh, sustainability. And they always have the positive and negative impact field. The main aim of this, and I come to the importance of the positive and negative impact field in the second. The main purpose of this tool is simply raise awareness of certain issues you need to take into account when you can make the biggest impact at the beginning of the product inception process. It's much easier to introduce a circularity concept into a product when you start than to do it later on. That's the main um, message here. And the impact canvas simply addresses a second problem. Many people, when they think about their products in terms of impact, only look at the positive impact. Let's say someone who develops a car sharing solution um, looks at, oh my God, lots of people will stop buying cars, use those shared vehicles, and then have a positive impact. They don't look at the negative impact 
which in many cases uh, outweighs the positive impact. For example, in terms of connected cars, it has been shown that in many cities traffic increases because people do not, as hoped, leave their um, basically stop buying cars to use car sharing, but they actually stop walking, they stop using public transport, they stop using bicycle and they do that. And so this tool is super important in this portfolio because it forces you to do an honest accounting or again, it helps you to actually bring awareness to the issues that are problematic. Now, finally, to the product ethics canvas. Why did I develop it? And um, what, what's actually the premise behind it? So the idea behind it uh, is uh, basically probably not new to any one of you uh, because you're, you're here today, you've, you find the topic interesting. It's becoming more and more obvious that digital products are creating significant negative impacts on our lives in addition to the positive impacts they're generating. And in many ways, I feel that we are probably similarly advanced here in terms of understanding as in the year maybe 2010, uh, if we would relate it to the topic of sustainability impact of, pro of, of products. So I, I, I always remember back in 2014 still, there were companies that would say, we do not want to take the issue of longevity of our products into account because it impacts our revenue. It reduces our aftermarket sales. Uh, for example, if you're a car, a car dealer or a car company. And similarly, it's the case for digital products. But that does not need to mean that we cannot make a start with raising awareness of employees about the impacts those products uh, can have. And there were several triggers that actually prompted me um, to develop this. On the one hand, I was really um, inspired by Tristan Harris in the US, um, whom you probably have read about, who, um, who started the Center for Humane Design, who was actually looking at this whole topic of how does, um, how does a digital product impact my well-being? He became famous with a little video that he did on the streets of New York, where he was walking around with a smartphone, citing a little poem, and he actually mused on how much this little thing, this little smartphone is controlling his life, how he's become addicted to likes. That was actually the original inspiration to think about how can we maybe um, solve this problem at the source. So can we generate an equivalent to the sustainable business model canvas which solves the problem of people using products that are unsustainable, driving products that are unsustainable by going to the source, to the very designers and companies that produce these products. Um, and the second impulse I got to actually develop it was, um, at the time I was working in a young startup um, in Berlin with a lot of product designers, UX designers and developers. And what I, what I, realized there was how much higher or how, how much more developed the moral compass of young employees is nowadays compared to maybe just 10 years ago. There were concrete examples where young employees who were still in their probation period and basically were at risk of getting fired if they would speak out would raise certain topics to the attention of the management team where ethical principles were violated. And that made me think, if we have the potential of young people or employees with their heart at the right, right place, they're willing to actually raise certain risks to the attention of management, even at risk of losing their jobs, then that's the perfect ground to tackle this problem where everyone thinks it's impossible to tackle. Uh, the, the topic of how do I take into account negative externalities in a digital product? And um, the, um, yeah, the, the final reason for me to actually work at this was this study that came out and there's a Harvard Business Re Review article that I can send around later on that showed that the moral case, the moral argument 
Um, am I still? Can you still hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, the, the third reason for me was really to see that actually data that supports the idea that employees can, can make a difference in the companies if they use the argument of what's the values that a company is supposed to stand for versus what's actually happening. Now, what does the digital product ethics canvas try to achieve? It tries to achieve the impossible. Impossible because most companies that are producing products that, harming, that are harming our lives are doing so because they're operating within the attention economy. And the attention economy, which I'm sure you have all heard about, basically works around a resource that just like oil in terms of the sustainability case is finite. And that resource is our attention. There's only so much attention that you can get from a uh, population until it runs out. So for example, companies such as YouTube competes with Fox News and Fox News competes with Netflix. And that means there's no cake that is growing. There's no cake of time that users have to spend on certain products that is constantly increasing in, in size. So what happens is that a vicious circle starts where companies who are operating within the attention economy are constantly trying to optimize the way they can hook users or customers to their products. It, that is because the attention economy essentially has a very simple and boring business model only. That business model is advertisement revenue. Facebook, for example, is a corporate that and, uh, and I, was, um, I was laughing initially because we were thinking of using that as an example, is a corporate that's actually uh, in a very uh, problem problematic space. Um, Facebook is a company that we all know creates a lot of negative effects through some of those issues I will talk about in a second. But Facebook is also completely dependent on advertisement revenue for its business model. And to change that is a huge challenge. And that's why I mean we're trying to tackle an almost impossible to solve problem. Um, so what this canvas does and how does it look like? So first of all, it, it's uh, th three sections. The um, left section in gray, the three fields uh, you see here, value proposition, company value revenue streams, and alternative revenue streams, is really basically the status quo of um, what does our company do and um, where do we create value? Um, and what, uh, what actually do we do to monetize that? And the way you use that canvas basically is you start with the top two fields. You start to write down, okay, our value proposition is in terms of Facebook, we are a social network where people want to share their lives and spend time on, for example. Um, and in the second field, you then write down what are our revenue streams in the first place? For example, in terms of Facebook, in a simplified way, of course, there are other ones, it's ad revenue. Basically, we are monetizing eyeballs on our product. And you can um, for it, already here start to think about uh, potential uh, conflicts of interest, but uh, that will become uh, more relevant in a second. And then once you've done that, um, either for a company that you're currently still developing or for an existing business. So it doesn't matter. You can use this product canvas for, develop, for the development of a new product, or you can use it also for the improvement of an existing product or company. You can look at the uh, central field, the, the central six fields. And there I have tried to categorize impact or effects of a digital product into six areas that are probably the most important ones. And those are, um, number one, preserving a user's focus. So one of the main negative impacts of digital products is that they distract users. So for example, um, you're using Gmail or Slack, which are tools that are designed to actually improve your productivity. But if you're really honest, you might realize that constant Slack notifications prevent you from working on a, um, on, a, uh, on a sizable chunk of time 
and from doing deep work essentially. We know that any distraction basically um, incurs cost, switching cost essentially between task A and task B and therefore has a huge negative impact on, um, on the productivity of the individual worker. So the idea here is that you ask, the, ask yourself the question, okay, do we as a digital product actually preserve a user's focus or as it is most likely the case, are we forced to constantly remind a user through a minder or a pop-up about our existence because we are obviously forced to generate revenue through the um, ad business model to actually disrupt the user. And the first purpose here is not so much to solve the problem. The first purpose is to actually become aware of it. And that already is an achievement in most of the companies that build such products. The second field, prevention of addictions, um, related to that is similarly, um, okay, um, again, do I, do I work towards a healthy engagement pattern of my users with, with my product? Or do I actively work on creating an addiction to it? So for example, let's take um, Netflix. Netflix is a company that became so successful in part because they have powerful algorithms that know what type of content a user will binge watch and what type of content will create the highest viral potential. Again, it's not the, it's not the purpose to actually solve it now, it's just to be aware of it and honestly make an accounting of the impact I have in that case. In terms of Netflix, yes, most likely I will have a negative impact. Um, next one is promoting high quality content. Um, and here simply, if you look at a Google feed in any area where you are, let's, let's for example say Germany right now, if you Google anything in Berlin, any news related uh, topic, you will see that apart from the typical newspapers that will pop up with news headlines, there are new newspapers that are basically just promoting clickbait. For example, one is called Der Westen in English, The West. It's the most horrific type of clickbaiting you can imagine. And I doubt that Der Westen would ever care but another company, let's say, which isn't that far down the line, let's say Spiegel Online, you would basically say, okay, do I really promote high quality content um, or do I actually make uh, compromises here in terms of quality just in order to create more clicks, just to fuel my advertisement revenue? The next one is prevention of um, algorithmic biases. So, for example, um, the most, the most typical example someone might think of in terms of algorithmic biases is, for example, if I, let's say, um, create um, an algorithm that, uh, that promotes search results, for example, that promotes certain um, results to only people of one demographic and completely different one to people of another demographic. Um, and that typically results in the filter bubbles that have been discussed heavily in the past five years, where you will only receive the content related to your demographic, and that creates a negative impact, of course. The negative impact is you promote further polarization in the society, you promote further alienation um, amongst different groups, let's say Republicans and Democrats, um, and it's, uh, it's a very bad impact. Then the next one is promoting offline choices. Um, we know that just being leading a life uh, online is actually uh, quite negative. You need to um, engage in the outside world in order to have a balanced existence, uh, good well-being. And here you do the same again. You check and you list what is my company, my product actually doing. Um, next one, promoting a healthy worldview. That is about um, in terms of the most prominent example, Instagram, 
do I promote healthy beauty ideals or do I create a fake image of reality that completely distorts opinion and therefore um, harms people? Another example would be porn, for example. And now if you have gone through all those areas um, and have listed what you have, what, you, what kind of impact you think you have, you can summarize it on the right hand side in this field where you list all the positive effects of your digital product and you list all the negative effects of your digital product. And at a minimum, you have done a very first step towards a impact assessment of your product. But the minimum is obviously not what the purpose of the digital product ethics canvas is. The purpose of the digital product ethics canvas is to be a tool for a discussion that nudges improvement of the company. And what do I mean by that? If you can, as an employee, show with this canvas as a communication tool that your company, despite different values that are publicly promoted, is clearly violating some of these values. And if you can at the same time show alternatives, options to minimize that impact, you have, and I truly believe that, a realistic chance that you can be heard and make a change. In other words, the goal of this tool is not only to make an assessment. The goal of this tool is to work as an innovation tool where, as a user, you can use the content here to think about how can we change that feature? How can we minimize the negative impact, number one? And in the best case, can we actually use the insights gained to think about alternative revenue streams so that we solve the problem at the core? And those two levels, just examples, for example, um, preserving of or prevention of addictions. At some time in history, someone at YouTube has decided that it makes sense to include a button in YouTube which switches off the automatic um, playback of the next video after you clicked on one video. For a while in YouTube, if you clicked on one YouTube video, it would automatically play the next video. This way, obviously, you're hooked and you're unlikely to stop watching and advertisement revenue of YouTube will be increased. But for some reason, they included this button where you can switch that off. And it's a wild guess here, but it's probably been a combination of the fact that actually this has some negative impact as well on the, on the user's well-being. So basically you can minimize certain, um, certain impacts. I think Netflix as well has a time limit um, how, how you consume content to prevent it. So there's small ways you can slowly change the content. That's step one. But the much more potent way to actually change your business is if you think, do we need to work within the attention eco economy based on advertisement revenue alone? Or are there different revenue streams which we could use? Maybe those different revenue streams could actually become more important if you, for example, improve the quality of our content so that we can actually completely un unravel the incentive to promote bad content in the first place. And uh, that's basically it. That's what the Digital Product Ethics Canvas is trying to achieve. Um, whereas the sustainable business model canvas and the impact canvas in terms of readiness and acceptance are already much more advanced. What I want to say is it's much more easy nowadays to argue for developing a product that includes circularity in its, in its concept that basically has a much higher recycling rate than a previous concept the digital product ethics canvas is quite early stage. And in a way, I understand when people are saying, you're asking for a lot, you're asking for a lot here, you're asking for employees to raise certain 
uh, issues to the attention of the company. You're asking for people to think about a different revenue stream. I'm aware of that, but I firmly believe that the tool actually helps because it helps employees to actually communicate those issues, communicate a violation of company values in a much more structured way. And that's all that the digital product ethics canvas is supposed to do. And I think it's all it can do. It's a tool for communicating where a company is violating its own values. And it's a tool for communicating and coming up with ideas how to minimize this negative impact. Yeah, that's uh, the um, intro to it. And I think now um, the idea would be to, first of all, talk about it, um, take on board any questions you have. It's an open discussion. We are a very small group. I think we can really afford to talk about skeptic um, comments about, well, what about this? So this, this is actually the right time now. And uh, finally, we can think about a number of products that you have in mind, which we could use to actually run this digital products ethics canvas on. So typically when I work with uh, students or with companies, what, uh, what typically happens is the group or the students have a certain product they're working on right now. And that product is on the top of their mind. That's where they're most uh, involved with. And that's what we use to complete any of those canvases I spoke about earlier. Thanks a lot, Robert, for uh, presenting the canvas. I will stop um, recording here um, so that everybody is aware of it.